This is obviously from before the Middle Ages. I have an introduction. These are the imperial Roman capitals, probably from around uh, the second century, somewhere. Uh, you can find this fragment in the uh, Forum Trajanum in Rome. And these capitals are justly famous. They are revered and they have been extensively studied, just as the revivals of these letter forms. When I was a student at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam, this article by James Mosley appeared in a publication called Alphabet 1964. It's about all the uh, revivals of the Trajan capitals. And the Trajan capitals, of course, you'll find in Rome at the foot of uh, this object. Notice something odd uh, on this image. In reality, there is a part missing um, about here, a triangular part, and uh, this is a very neat restoration done by a Japanese designer. This is one of the uh, mini revivals. It's one of uh, James Mosley's uh, favorite revivals. Very elegant Baroque, early Baroque version of the uh, Capitalis Quadrata by the Italian calligrapher Giovan Franceschi, Francesco Cresci from his Il Perfetto Scrittore, published in Rome in 1570. And here is another version from uh, 1586 in the uh, Piazza San Pietro, right in front of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, um, carrying the uh, Vatican obelisk. Um, and it, this lettering is by Luca Orfi uh, da Fano. And here is a detail. And beautifully carved. Uh, beautiful revival. Um, these men very subtly varied the um, uh, example, the original. Um, when I, as a student, uh, again, in the early 60s, uh, went to London, so-called Trajan lettering was everywhere. Um, this is an example from a publication called the art of lettering and its uses in diverse crafts and trades, the report of a special committee of the British Institute of Industrial Art, published by the Oxford University Press in 1931. The Roman imperial capitals had become British imperial capitals. And what is very sad is that most of all this Trajan lettering, which you saw everywhere, really, in London, was replaced in the late 60s and 70s of the 20th century by Helvetica. Joe Lyon tea shops, for example, uh, first had very elegant, uh, curly uh, Victorian lettering, not the Trajan capitals, but uh, the next thing you saw was Helvetica slanted on their facades. This sheet I received when I became a student at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam in 1963. It was handed out to us by my calligraphy teacher. And do you remember from the first talk we had this morning by Michael Twyman, the beautiful uh, capitals he drew, uh, had drawn um, in white. Um, they might have come from the same example. Um, it's something I have to uh, discuss with Michael. I hope he's still here. The Trajan capitals continue to be revived and used, as with Adobe Trajan by Carol Tombley, 1989, here on the cover of a book published in 2007. Trajan is also, I'm told, very popular on American movie posters. The Trajan capitals, or Roman capitals in general, 
have enormously influenced lettering and type design. In my opinion, their value has been somewhat overrated, whereas another model has been much underrated. Um, this other model, the Romanesque capitals, used in Europe from shortly before 1000 till shortly after 1200 AD, has also been refined often, although this is little known. And I'm going to show you a couple of originals first, and then a number of the revivals. And while the Trajan caps have been followed rather slavishly, the Romanesque capitals seem to have encouraged much more freedom. This is my first of example of Romanesque capitals in situ uh, from southern France on the tympanum of the pilgrimage church of saint foy in Conque on one of the uh, pilgrimage routes to Santiago de Compostela. Typical are, as you can see, the flat-topped A's with broken crossbars, uh, uncial E's, M's with short diagonals, R's with nicely curved legs, O's pointed at their tops and bottoms, and all S's leaning to the left. That's very typical of the whole period. Uh, this kind of lettering you could find in Europe during two centuries, from southern Norway all the way down to Sicily, and from the British Isles to deep into Eastern Europe, Hungary, um, Czechia, um, Slovenia, um, really everywhere. Um, the Roman caps, of course, were used all around the Mediterranean. That was uh, basically what connected the Roman world. The Roman world was totally around the Mediterranean. Uh, so these capitals, the Romanesque capitals, were uh, much further north and uh, truly European. Um, the difference, as you can see, between thick and thin parts is uh, moderate vertical strokes widen towards their ends, top and bottom. Horizontal strokes are often wedge-shaped and the serifs are short and triangular. A special feature here is um, right here. Um, in O Peccatores, um, a round C and an angular C. Um, this sculpture, which is part of a large tympanum on the uh, facade of the church, was made between 1130 and 1135. I'm coming back to the mixing of what you see here is uh, right beside each other the three basic uh, kinds of letter forms that were used in the period. Um, descendants of the Roman capitals, uncials from basically the fourth century and from the eastern part of the Mediterranean area, and angular letter forms that are basically insular or um, Celtic in origin. Here is another example part of the uh, dome of the creation in the San Marco in uh, Venice, made between 1215 and 1280. So that makes this a very late example of Romanesque capitals. And they are rather condensed. This was a trend throughout the period. You saw in uh, Conk the capitals are still rather wide. Here they are much more condensed. And uh, all kinds of other things are going on, of which you will see a few more examples. TR, you see up there, um, combined. Uh, you see uh, an uncial E. You see a regular E over here, um, an enlarged T, um, a smaller I within an L, um, all kinds of nice uh, features. And actually, with uh, the tesserae, the little pieces of uh, uh, stone that this mosaic was uh, made with, they have uh, remarkably well represented the uh, Romanesque uh, letter forms. Here is a part of an inscription on the western facade of the cathedral in uh, Pisa, the Duomo Santa Maria. This inscription effectively constitutes a catalogue of Romanesque letter forms. Notable forms include round and angular versions of C, 
E G H M N T N U minus Q N matches the other capitals in height, round and angular spiraling G you can see, M's with diagonals short of the baseline, O's pointed at top and bottom again, the elegantly curved leg, and again, all S's slanting to the left. Um, they didn't bother about balancing the S as we do nowadays. Let them lean uh, was apparently uh, their idea. And um, one of my favorite shapes is I point up here, right above one, two, three, the fourth line from the bottom, third line from the top, the um, angular G, the sort of spiraling G, uh, which has gone angular. Uh, and right beside it, you see an uh, unshield U. Um, here in the third line from the bottom, you see a different shape of unshield U. Uh, here's an unshield E again. Uh, yeah, fantastic stuff. I love this. Um, one of the features is that uh, not only do these letter forms come from three different, totally different sources, um, the variation is also amazing. When you look at the top left, you see um, a regular T and an uh, uncial T or um, a half uncial T uh, next to each other. And um, this kind of mixing was uh, totally random, arbitrary. One of the key words in the period was variation, which you will find in architecture when you go travel around Europe. Uh, no building is totally like another building. There is, there is immense variation. Sometimes it's bewildering. What is, for example, a um, common characteristic of uh, almost all Romanesque buildings is that you can see from the outside how the uh, interior um, is put together. Um, the, in, the, the exterior reflects the interior. So it basically, it's a very clear kind of architecture, and I think this kind of clarity is reflected in the letter forms. Despite uh, the complexity you see in the uh, character combinations, in the mixing of all the different variations, um, still the whole thing is uh, very clear. There is one amazing thing. We remain in Pisa for a few minutes. Uh, what you see here is um, the outer wall of the uh, cathedral in Pisa, where they used so-called spolia, uh, parts of uh, Roman buildings. Very handy to uh, have uh, lots of building material uh, around, ready-made, um, you could uh, apply in uh, your own uh, construction. Um, so uh, Romanesque stonecutters, Romanesque uh, sculptors, saw the um, Roman letter forms. They were very well aware, uh, aware of their existence, but they never copied them. They used their own letter forms, which I think is uh, remarkable. Here is, uh, for your convenience, um, uh, a uh, sorting. I've sorted out for you the three different kinds of uh, capitals. The top three lines show you the descendants of the Roman capitals. Then on the um, uh, fourth line from the top, you see uh, the uncials that were mainly used. And uh, here you see uh, the uh, uh, injurer letter forms that were used, including a, uh, an angular S. And then there was, were a couple of letter forms uh, from very different sources. This is, for example, a very often um, appearing uh, form of G in Roman provincial uh, inscriptions from the second and the third and the fourth uh, century. And here is the uh, lowercase n uh, enlarged uh, into a cap. The y, by the way, is uh, very rare. And now we come to the echoes uh, from the Romanesque uh, period. They were first revived 
in northern Italy, as can be seen, for example, on an altar piece from 1333, so roughly 100 years after the Romanesque capitals turned very slowly into Gothic capitals, a phase which I have uh, skipped. Um, this uh, altarpiece was made for Siena Cathedral by Simona Martini and Lippo Memmi, it's famous, uh, now in the Uffizi in uh, Florence. What you see here is the uh, spiraling G, for example, Uncial E, typical A with a crossbar at the top, um, pure Romanesque letter forms. By that time, um, Gothic capitals were widely used. So why these artists um, reverted to Romanesque capitals is a mystery. Many later examples can be seen in inscriptions in Florence, such as this one made by Luca della Robbia around 1435, about 100 years later than the uh, previous example. Uh, it's now in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo in uh, Florence. These label, letter forms have been labeled early Renaissance capitals. And you may see here the example of um, Hermann Zapp's Optima typeface. Um, they show several features of the Romanesque capitals. The A's, for example, are flat topped. The R has a curved leg. The S's slant to the left. The triangular serifs have been dropped, as well as all exotic letter forms, the uncials and the angular versions of the round letters. This illustration is from a very nice book, A History of, History of Lettering, which appeared in 1986 and was written by Nicolette Gray, who was an early enthusiast of these revivals, as well as of the original Romanesque letter form. She has devoted a whole chapter to the Romanesque uh, capitals. Outside Florence, this model has also been used as on the uh, tomb of Cardinal Martinez de Chiaves in the San Giovanni in Laterano in Rome, 1447. And this examples, uh, example from 1465 uh, is in uh, Modena, mentions an old monastery of St. Euphemia in that city. Here the angular C is used, which is uh, quite surprising, but aware, uh, elsewhere it was dropped, together with many of the Romanesque ligatures, as well as with the nesting of letter forms. It is possible, of course, that lettering from the old monastery has served as an example, but we'll never know. This is in the uh, Museo Lapid Lapidario in uh, Modena. A really amazing example is uh, to be found on the Gent altar piece from 1432 by Hubert and Jan van Eyck, one of the great masterpieces of uh, Flemish, early Flemish painting. Here is the part with uh, Mary, and we go to uh, part of the uh, semicircle behind her. And what you see in uh, 1432 is pure Romanesque lettering. You see a, a, a regular E and an uncial E. You see a square C um, somewhere in uh, near uh, the uh, workshop of the brothers van Eyck. There must have been uh, examples of Romanesque lettering still around. Since then, Many of these examples have been uh, uh, destroyed, churches have been torn down, uh, so we, we will never be able to find the uh, original. And then we come to a part um, 16th, 17th and even 18th century. And it's surprising that uh, all over Europe um, you can find uh, influences of uh, Romanesque lettering. This is an illustration from a book by Alan Bartram, The English Lettering Tradition. Um, and therein he shows several examples of lettering that seem to be inspired by Romanesque capitals, such as this inscription from Bradford, made in 1667. I agree it is possible to make too much of a few characteristics, but the moment an A with a crossbar at the top 
and a broken middle crossbar shows up in the company of an M with short and even curved diagonals, R's with curved right legs, then I think Roman capi Romanesque capitals can't be far away. And here you see an example from Vienna, from the Church of St. Michael, that was built between 1219 and 1221. It shows A's with broken crossbars, uh, an M with short diagonals, R's with double curved right legs, S's tilting to the left, mini strokes are wedge shaped and the serifs are short and triangular. It's an inscription from 1740. The same characteristics are present on this tombstone from 1740 also for a French woman, Sarah Le Bachelet, in Hameln in Germany. Throughout the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, these characteristics regularly turn up in inscriptions without a hint about their origins. In the 19th century, a wide interest grew in the applied arts of the past, expressed, among other things, in collections of ornaments and letter forms. This is a page from Henry Shaw's The Handbook of Medieval Alphabets and Devices from 1853, which I bought years ago from Morris, who is now downstairs with his uh, uh, antiquarian books. Uh, showing letter forms from the Royal Bible, a manuscript but made between 820 and 850. Um, the manuscript is in the British Library in London, and these are the ancestors of the Romanesque capitals, as you could find them in manuscripts. The whole mix of the three kinds of letter forms occurred in the uh, British Isles and uh, first appeared in uh, manuscripts before it uh, started to uh, be applied in uh, inscriptions. And here is a page from Lettering in Ornament by Louis F. Day from 1902, showing letter forms from the wooden doors of the great pilgrimage church in Le puy en velay southern France, southeastern south France even. Quite interesting stuff. Such publications were part of a much wider interest expressed, for example, in the architectural neo-styles of the 19th century. Here you see the Natural History Museum in London, designed by Alfred Waterhouse, in his interpretation of the Romanesque style, completed in 1880. It's next door to the uh, Victoria and uh, Albert Museum. Just a few more examples. I'm not going to give you a complete overview that would take all afternoon, and uh, there are more speakers. This is uh, an example uh, of the uh, German designer Otto Hoop, who died in 1949, uh, published by the Klingsport Foundry in Offenbach, um, called Unziale, Hoop Unziale, as you can see at the bottom right. Um, the capitals are clearly based on Romanesque examples, but the uh, lowercase is his own uh, fantasy. Actually, during the period, in the Romanesque period, uh, the lowercase used was still the Carolingian minuscule, um, being more and more condensed, um, becoming uh, ever more angular, and slowly turning into the uh, Gothic script. But this is a nice uh, addition to the uh, Romanesque uh, capitals. Here is another example um, from the Bauersche Gießerei in Frankfurt, published in 1931, by, uh, de designed by Emil Rudolf Weiss, who died in 1942. And the script, as, uh, the letter forms are named, as you can see, Weiss Lapidar, meaning based on stone cut letter forms. I've never been able to find out. Uh, what the example for Weiss uh, could have been uh, totally uncertain. In his own uh, notes that he left, there is nothing. And um, Jerry Cinnamon has done a very nice uh, publication about all the work of uh, Emil Rudolf Weiss and Jerry Cinnamon. The, couldn't give me a hint either. 
Um, as you can see, he has made a couple of alternative uh, characters, notably the uh, A with a crossbar at the top and an uh, uncial E to be used as uh, alternatives. More designs like these appeared during the first half of the uh, 20th century, together with several designs with lower ties to the high or early Middle Ages. For example, Peignot by Cassandre um, was based on Unschuld's. It, this was published in, I haven't mentioned the date here, I think it was 1937. Um, um, this was based on uncials and half uncials from the 5th and the 6th centuries, which were, of course, also ancestors of the uh, Romanesque capitals. So, um, Cassandra turned to the same source. The American artist and illustrator Ben Shan, who lived from 1898 till 1969, has made some works that are undoubtedly inspired by Romanesque lettering, such as this text, which is probably from the uh, mid-50s. After finishing his art school education, Shan traveled in Europe, where he may have seen, for example, an inscription on the bronze doors of Mainz Cathedral in Germany. This is a part of the so-called Adalbert privilege, from around 1135. Really a fantastic inscription wherein, uh, just as in Pisa, you can find almost any letter form used during the uh, period. Um, a more recent example is uh, Mason, as you know, originally called Manson, by Jonathan Barnbrook, published in 1992 by Emmy Gray. Um, again, this one is much more freely inspired by medieval sources than uh, previous examples you have seen. Um, this was uh, based on uh, letter forms that Jonathan had seen in insular manuscripts such as uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, which he uh, uh, freely interpreted. Lindisfarne Gospels were made between 715 and 720. Alchemy by Jeremy Tenkart from 1969, uh, 1990, uh, 1998, I mean, Jeremy is from 1969, um, was based on the same source. And here is Sophia by Matthew Carter, uh, published in 1993. Um, Sophia was inspired by Byzantine examples from the 6th century and from Constantinople. And Byzantine influences can be found in Romanesque letter forms in southern Italy, for example. In 1999, the Dutch designer René Knip, a nice colleague of mine, made these letter forms for a cultural center in Amsterdam, housed in the oldest church of this city. He based this design on examples he had found in a German edition of the book by Louis F. Day, Alphabets Old and New, Neue und Alte Alphabeten, published in 1902. And as you can see, he has very freely uh, varied, actually, the Romanesque letter writers and sculptors did this too. They made their own variations continuously. And here is my own Alfirata, published last year by Type Together, uh, which is uh, closely based on Romanesque uh, sources. This is the uh, regular version. I gave a talk about this uh, type design in Amsterdam last year, uh, giving you uh, all the sources in great detail. And there too, I showed my Alfirata irregular. This is the irregular regular. Um, which uh, shows you part of angular insular letter forms and of uncials they returned herein, together with the random distribution of alternates in text. So I followed the example of uh, the Romanesque stonecutters, and usually lowercase letter forms are mostly round, while capitals are mainly angular, 
And in this version, these characteristics were swapped. And what was, of course, uh, great fun uh, was to, after the example again of the Romanesque stonecutters, to create your own letter forms. As you can see, for example, in the lowercase g um, at the bottom over there. And here is the uh, black version of my Alvirata. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our um, next speaker.